All right, so I'm continuing to look at the different steps to dreaming again, what we're calling redreaming. I'm looking at the different steps to dreaming again. And I want to encourage you to have an open heart this morning because I believe that each person who is here today is here by appointment. No one is here by accident. Amen. So point number six or step number six, address the issues of your day. You see, when you dream again, the dream that God gives you is supposed to solve a problem. The dream that God gives you is supposed to solve a problem. If you look at John 15 verse 8, it says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, proving yourselves to be my disciples. So this shows me that my fruitfulness gives God's glory, God glory. If I'm not fruitful, God is not glorified. Giving God glory is not just saying, praise God, you know, and being super, super spiritual. You know, some people come in church and they think that they really glorify Jesus because of their narrative, because of their nomenclature, Right? They come into church and they say a lot of nice spiritual things, but that doesn't give God glory. The Bible here says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, proving yourselves to be my disciples. So one of the key characteristics of a disciple is fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. Ask the person next to you, are you fruitful? What do we mean by being fruitful? Being fruitful means you're multiplying yourself. Being fruitful means you're making disciples. Being fruitful means you're using your gifts and your talents to God's honor and glory. And you're being effective with what he's placed inside of you. I've said this before that God is an investor. And he's invested in you certain natural talents. But it's up to you and me to nurture those gifts and to nurture those talents and to make sure that we're used by God in those areas. Amen? You see, God has given us natural talents. Now it's time for us to open our hearts so that he adds his super to our natural. Amen? So many Christians are still operating in the natural realm and we praise them and we adore them but they could be doing so much more with regards to fruitfulness if they just added God's super. Very often when I'm coaching, I work as an executive coach for those who don't know, when I'm coaching executives, sometimes I sit there and I begin to say things to them that I didn't know in the natural. Now there's stuff I know in the natural but what brings results is where you can open your heart to God's spirit and allow him to say certain things through you. Sometimes when I'm coaching people, I sit down and literally afterwards I have to take notes on what I had said. Because I had never thought those concepts before. Are you hearing me this morning? Now that's in my field. But I believe that some of you who are designers, God is going to give you supernatural design. Whether it's for websites, whether it's for film shows that you make. And Sipo looked up at me. Film shows that you do. I'm speaking prophetically now, Sipo. God is going to give you supernatural dreams. I believe it's actually already happened. He's giving you dreams and concepts that you will use. Because he wants to add his super to your natural. Because you're in his will and you're in his purpose. The thing you studied, there's no confusion in God. God's grace was upon you. I even see you in your, in your closet by yourself. I see you when you were a student getting certain results and you were blown away and sometimes you're even thinking, is it because the teachers like me? You even had that thought. Am I right? You even had that thought. But God had added his super to your natural and he's going to use you so mightily in the film industry. Guys, watch this space. Amen. Amen. All right. So we bear much fruit and when we're bearing much fruit, not just a little bit, we prove ourselves to be his disciples. So I want to ask you the question, why do you think you were born now? Or 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, depending on when you were born. Why do you think you were born for this generation? Why do you think you are alive right now? Sometimes my wife says to me, I'm so glad like we were born like in this, like now, you know? I thought if I was born in another generation, I might not have met you. I don't know if it was she, her saying it to me or me saying it to her, but those are the kind of things we say to each other. You can say, no. 
Okay? Let me ask you another question. The people you care about the most, what do they need from you that only you can give them? The people you care about the most, what do they need from you that only you can give them? How many of you know that the children that you have, God actually called you to be their parent. Isn't that powerful? That God knew that Mark was going to be born. And he had assigned that these are the best parents for Mark, for Mark to be the best he can ever be. Isn't that powerful? And anyone else who's got a child called Mark, the Mzembes also. <laughs> All right? Isn't it powerful? I count it a privilege when I look at my kids and I see how they're wired, then I'm like, okay, Lord, in your own wisdom, you kind of felt that, okay, these are the parents I'm assigning to raise these kids up. Like, okay, so we, we obviously have something in us. We obviously have the raw materials. That's a very powerful thing to believe, especially when you feel like, God, I cannot do this thing. The Bible tells us, and it's very powerful, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, His divine power has given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. His divine power has given you, Rufaro, everything you need for life. And you know what falls under the category of life? Being a, a wife, being a mother, being a good lecturer, being a, all those things. He's given you everything that you need for life and also for godliness. So when people say, ah, no, I can't be a Christian. It's difficult nowadays to be a Christian. Oh, can I ask you a question? Yes. Are you a Christian? Can I ask you a question? Are you a Christian? Okay. No, it's difficult for some people, but God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. What is your purpose? What is your dream? He's given you the raw materials for it. Are you about to immigrate? He's given you the raw materials for it. For those about to immigrate. Let me ask you another question. Why have those people been brought into your life? Why have they been brought into your life? Ask that. The friends you have, especially the ones from God, why have they been brought into your life? I have to ask myself that as a pastor. Why are some of you here? Why have you been brought into my life? How many of you know that relationships are mutual? Relationships are mutual. So you've been brought into our lives because we've got something for you. And our destinies are linked. That's why it's so important how we guard and preserve our relationships, eh? But at the same time, there's something in you for us. And it's important that we view each other after the Spirit. Someone was saying that to me the other day, saying, I prayed and I said, God, help me to know Paul by revelation. Amen? Because sometimes we know people after the flesh. If you know someone after the flesh, you can just think, ah, Wimbai, there, she's got her stilettos and a nice handbag and a coat and a funky hairstyle. Maybe that's all you see. But when you get to know her and you see what she carries in the spirit, everything changes in how you relate to her. Amen? So we have to address the issues of the day. The vision and the dream God gives you has to address the issues of the day. The vision and the dream God has given you has to be solving some kind of problem. What problem have you identified to solve? Let's think about that. If you're struggling with a dream, what problem have you identified to solve? Have a look at Psalm 55. Verse 9 to 11. Psalm 55 verse 9 to 11. David is praying here. And he prayed in interesting prayers. Some of you would freak out if some of us started praying these prayers in prayer meetings. Confuse, O Lord. Divide their tongues. <laughs> I mean, God had already done that in Genesis 11, right? Tower of Babel, he confused their tongues. But anyway. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. In order to address the issues in our city, in our nation, we have to have observed. We have to have been like Nehemiah who literally observed and he looked at the wall to actually study how ruined it was. Some of you here are saying, I'm called to women in society. Have you observed the wall? Have you studied what's going on amongst women in society? In order to have a dream that addresses the issues. 
He says, O Lord, divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around her upon her walls. And iniquity and mischief are in her midst. How did he know this? He obviously had done his homework to look at the current reality. If God has called you to solve issues in your family, my question is, do you know and understand what's in the midst of your family? Do you understand what spirits you're dealing with in your family? Jesus said, unless, the, unless you deal with a strong man, talking about a demonic entity, talking about principalities and powers, unless you deal with that root issue in your family or in your society, guess what happens? You won't overcome the enemy. What is the core issue that your family is facing today? Are you drawing a line in the sand and actually saying enough is enough? We're not going to have this weakness running through our family line anymore. Amen? He says, iniquity and mischief are in her midst. Destruction is in her midst. Oppression and deceit do not depart from her streets. He was able to name the issues of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, how you diagnose a problem determines the solution. I have people coming to me and saying, can you help us? Our teenage child is giving us problems. And they sometimes identify the issue as being with their teenage child. I go in and I start hearing the story of the child and I realize that there's a dysfunctional family system. Are you hearing me this morning? You see, if you diagnose the problem as being limited to one person in the family, then you'll address it with what, that one individual. But when you diagnose the problem as being a systemic issue, what happens? You diagnose it and then you solve it at that level. How many of you have lost loved ones in your lives because they were misdiagnosed? So they were being treated, yes. And the medicine was available, yes. But they were treating the wrong thing. I believe that very often what happens is we don't get breakthrough in our lives because we're praying the wrong prayers. We don't get breakthrough in our lives because we've misdiagnosed the situation. Churches are no longer effective because very often they think they can just preach at a problem and the problem goes away. And we don't deal with the root. I believe right now God is giving us revelation concerning what the root issues are in our lives. What the root issue is in your marriage. I remember counseling a particular couple. And I do what I call the marriage destroyers. And we, some of you have done that with me. And we look at all the cards and so on. And some, some couples have just a few marriage destroyers. And some, you know who you are, have quite a lot of them. And it was interesting because with the one couple, I said, can you see, it seems like you've got lots of issues. But when you look at this scenario, if this were to stop, just this one thing, where would you be at in your marriage? And they said, you know what, if this issue was resolved, just this one thing, if this pattern of behavior stopped, just this one thing, we would just, our marriage would be so close to heaven. Very often in families and in organizations, the root issue is just one or two things. The rest of the issues that we get overwhelmed by are just the children of those one or two root issues. Are you hearing me this morning? Find out what the strong man is in your family. Find out what the strong man is in your business. Find out what the strong man is in our society and address it at root level. If you are called to women, you must know what the current reality is that women are facing in this nation right now. What are the major issues? Discrimination. Inequality in terms of access to resources. Are you hearing me? Domestic violence. The list goes on. But God has called you to solve that. God has called you to address that. If you are called to women in society, don't just say, I'm called to women, I'm called to women, but not know what the issues are. God has called us to be fruitful. Your fruitfulness will be seen in your ability to address the issues of the day. Are you hearing me this morning, saints? Okay? Maybe you've been called to address issues of xenophobia and how many feel that when you address these issues it's not just about going and stopping the, the perpetration stopping the actual behavior against these people it's also about teaching the people how to manage their own rage against it there's a lot of discrimination in our nation but you know what I've noticed sometimes the bigger problem is people learning to manage their own rage 
in how they react towards that discrimination. How many of you know that God anoints us to do? When you say, Lord, anoint me, Lord, anoint me, it's like, to do what? He doesn't just anoint you so that you lie in bed and have goosebumps or that you come to church and have carpet time. Like, look, it's, it's fine when we fall under the power of God and we shake and God moves in our hearts, but that's a starting point. My interest is what happens when we get up? What happens when we get up? There must be a change. See, God anoints us to do. And what does he anoint us to do? He anoints us to solve issues. He anoints us to destroy stuff. And he anoints us to build. If you look at the prophet Jeremiah, what does he say? God calls him and he says, go and uproot and tear down certain things. And then he also calls him to, he says, go and build and plant. Here's the catch. For many of us as Christians, when we think of our dream and we ponder concerning our dream in life and what God has called us to do, we just focus on the building. We just focus on what he's called us to build. But how many of you know that sometimes you have to destroy certain things before you can build up others? How many of you know that when God called Gideon, what was one of the first things that Gideon ended up doing? He went and he broke down the idols of his fathers, didn't he? The Astra pole and all those things because there was godlessness there. In fact, they were mixing things. They were talking about their past in terms of, but God did this, God did that. Meanwhile, they were worshipping idols. One of the first things Gideon did before he could deal with his enemies physically in a physical war, what did he do? He went and he tore down the idols of his fathers. Some of you have focused on things to build and plant and God is saying, first destroy certain things. And there's an anointing for destruction. Are you following me? There's an anointing to destroy certain things. Some of you have taken over teams in the workplace and God is saying, you know what, you need to uproot gossip first before you can build trust. Some of you in your families, you're trying to build an altar to God, saying, God, we want to worship you. God, we want to worship you. But there are things you have to address even with your extended family. Some of you, with your extended families, you make up excuses to avoid some of the rituals that they're doing in terms of their ancestral worship. And you just say, ah, oh, no, not, not this time. Ah, oh, no, we've got a school function. No, tell them that I'm a worshiper of Jesus Christ and that the Bible tells me that there is only one way to the Father and that is through Jesus Christ, only one mediator. Tell them that's what you believe. Then they'll stop hounding you and bothering you. Are you hearing me? It's time we have some radical Christianity. Instead of this sort of, you know, flimsy, sheepish, ah, oh, no, I'm, I'm, so, I'm busy. God anoints you and me to solve issues. God anoints you and me to destroy certain things. What has he called you to destroy? What has he called you to destroy? And God has called us to build. Just think about your family setting right now. You see, what happens is the people around you, they need to be strong in terms of a healthy self-esteem and to actually know that God views them as lovable. And He does. And it's their responsibility. But you know that husbands, you are the primary minister into your wife's life. You're the primary person, Tabatso. Caught so in a couple of weeks. You're the primary person God has called to help your wife, to help Tumi, to help Sidi, to help her feel those feelings of love. Are you hearing me? So they must know that God loves them, but He's made you the primary minister to reinforce the emotion. When I pray for my wife, I must be praying, saying, God, help me to be a conduit of your love for her. God, give me a revelation of how you see her. In the same way that God the Father said, this is my beloved son, when Jesus was being baptized, with whom I am well pleased. Father, may you give me a revelation of how I can reinforce the fact that Tracy is loved by God and Tracy has found God's pleasure. 
Many of us are very good at reinforcing the love of God, but we're not as good at reinforcing the pleasure of God. How many of you, when you arrive home, feel that the people at home delight in you as opposed to tolerate you? Address the issues of the day. Address the issues of the day. If you are called to rescue a nation, do you know from what you are rescuing it? By the way, when we use that word save, in the Greek it's the word sozo. And it literally speaks of salvation, not just spiritually, right? But a salvation of the soul and also of the body. It's complete salvation. And when we talk about a nation being rescued by God, one of the words for save is actually literally to rescue someone that's drowning. And I believe that when salvation comes to this nation, to the people of this nation, it is figuratively speaking of rescuing the nation from disaster. What are we rescuing this nation from? What are we rescuing this nation from? You can, you can shout out. I know we don't usually do this in church. Go for it. Let's participate. Why not? Just shout it out. Clever go church people. <laughs> We're saving this nation from corruption. Hyrone said that, not me. Poverty. Woo. From? Huh? From religion. From the spirit of religion. Yes. State capture. <laughs> That's why Wimbai had a smirk on her face when she said that. Maybe I should be protecting your identities by not repeating your names. So I won't repeat your names. Just say, we're rescuing the nation from what? Racism. Racism. Hmm? An identity crisis from our law student over there, top student, distinction student. Yes. <laughs> From idols, idolatry, mm -hmm. anarchy. Guys, if we don't know what we're rescuing the nation from, then we don't know what our mission is. We'll just go into the world with our own individualized visions. I want to build a business for myself. No. Step number seven. Dream into the future. Dream into the future. The dreams God has given us have to be relevant. They have to take us into the future. If you say to me, Paul, this is my dream, and you show it to me, and it's in writing, and it's got an action plan, I'm going to make comments concerning where the world is going. You see, we are the real futurists, aren't we? We are prophetic people. God shows us things to come. And it's important that the vision I have, the dream I have, is relevant not for the 80s. The 80s have gone. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, the Wenwees. Who are the Wenwees here? You know, back in the day. Yeah, back in the day. No, that's happened. Now the vision God has given you and me is for not the past, but it's for where we're going. Now here's the thing. The Chinese, they think in centuries, don't they? I remember my sister-in-law, she used to be a professional golfer and she won the tournament in, in China. And I remember her coming back at a certain point and she said, it's amazing how the, the Chinese think in centuries. You see this highway, but you don't, see road, you don't see cars on it. Because they're thinking in a number of years' time, we're linking up these two cities and therefore we need a highway. Yet when I speak to people who live in the four ways area where we used to live, what do they say? They say, traffic. Sorry, I'm late for my workshop. Traffic. Why? Why do they say that? Because there are a whole lot of new townhouses that have been built and built and built, but the road system hasn't changed. Hello? Why? Because we're not planning for the future. How I many of you know that the, the Chinese, they think in centuries. On the African continent, if you look and you do a study, you'll see that our approach to life, it's like sitting on the how train. You know what I'm saying? The how train is going that way, but you're sitting looking back that way. <laughs> We focus so much on the past and present. No, but we did this, and because we did this, we're entitled to this. And we have debates about the past. Now, there's a place for the past. There's our heritage. There are all sorts of good things in the past. But hello, God wants us to be visionaries. We are the futurists. We are a prophetic people. 
You know, the Chinese, the way they think, and this is one of the reasons they're taking over a whole lot of the world right now. What they do is they pause and they say, you know what, in 80 years time, we're going to need to do A, B, C, D. So we need some people with the following trades. This trade, this trade, and this trade. So we're going to start some academies, some trade schools, so that our little kids right now at five can specialize and start learning the following trades because we're going to need that in this country in the next few years. If you want to lead people, one of the biggest things people look for in leaders and this is based on research, is a long-range view of things. A multi-generational vision. Because everyone out there who isn't leading, they're taking it one day at a time. But they're looking for people with a clear vision. They're looking for people with a clear dream. They're looking for people who will say, you know what, guys, in the next five years, this is what I see happening. I can see around the corner. So let's start building this way. And you become the leader who doesn't just see opportunities, you seize opportunities. Amen? I believe God is raising up business people here who will be true futurists. Where God will show you where the world is going. Amen? I was speaking to Eugene and I believe that you carry that from our phone conversation. I was speaking to Eugene and he was saying, this is where South Africa is going. So this is where it's good to invest. Amen? What is God showing you concerning the future? Align your dream with where the world is going. We are the true futurists. One of the problems with the education system in this country, and I'm not saying all schools, but a lot of schools, is that people are learning things that are relevant for the 80s. I don't know why I'm not saying the 90s. 80s is just sounds older. Right? You know, it's 80s music, 80s. Although those of us who grew up in the 80s, we like 80s music, don't we? If you like 80s music, say amen. amen. Okay. Yeah, but it's just the music, not necessarily the fashion and other stuff. Okay, it's the music. Okay? <laughs> Why don't you start? Those of you who are good at programming, and I'm seeing some of our geeks here. Who's a nerd? Who's a geek? Raise your hand. They're proud of it. Look at Emily. Look at Theo. They're proud of it. Look at Ishe. They're proud of it. It used to be a diss when I was growing up, you know, and say, oh, that nerd. Now it's like Nerds United. They're probably a soccer team which will come up. <laughs> Do you play for NU? Did you say Man U? No, NU. NU. Nerds United. You see them there with their glasses. <laughs> All right. So, so the people who are the nerds and the geeks today, if they were thinking as futurists, they will be starting online schools right now, training up kids in how to program. That's the language of the future. I want my kids to know how to program. I, they're telling me, we want to invent computer games and do this and this, starting to design, and then we'll do this and this. And I said, do you, do you have the time? Instead of playing the computer games, are you willing to learn coding? Go and speak to Emily and learn how to code. Are you willing to spend your whole holiday learning how to code and invent games? Uh, actual, uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So where's the world going right now? I got to meet a guy called Graham Codrington, a futurist, and he spoke just before my talk. It was a particular event, and I started learning a few things, and he began to tell us that by 2025 or 2035, the jobs that your company has today will no longer exist, right? Not all of them, but a lot of them. About 25% or so, or, or even 50% of them would have gone. Why? Because of automation. Because of intelligent robotics. The stuff that you see in movies, more and more I'm realizing when I speak to people about it, I say, oh, did you see that on this movie and so on? And they're telling me that's already happening, Paul. It's just not in the, in the marketplace for everyone. But it's already there. So those of you who rely heavily on being employed by someone, just be very careful. Because it's true, robotics is coming. And the guys are interested in their cash. Don't be conned thinking that they're just all interested in job creation and so on. They're not sleeping. They're thinking like, oh, I'm so glad that I've employed Kotsu. Oh. oh. That's not their main thing. Their main thing is to make cash. Right? To make money. 25% of the jobs are also going to be lost through outsourcing. Because a lot of you who are just serving one employee right now, for the next 30 years or so, you'll find yourself actually offering your skills, but to multiple people. That's why one of the best things we can be teaching our kids in school today is how to be good entrepreneurs. 
Because if we keep relying on government, relying on other people to create jobs, let me tell you something, there's no one out there where their main mission in life is to create a job for you. But there's talent that God has given you and I. And ownership is important, guys. I want to encourage you as a Christian. Ownership is important. And don't be afraid of taking risks. I'm not saying everyone is called to be an entrepreneur. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is those skills that you're offering your organization, start thinking of how you can offer those same skills to three or four other people. Amen? The risk is big, but the reward is great. Are you hearing me this morning? The risk is big, but you know how you spell faith? R-I-S-K. Seriously. All right? So a lot of people are going to be working part-time. How many of you know that if you've got audio, I've been thinking to myself, all the audio material I've got, and it's lots, I need to convert into video and into something that's mobile-friendly. That's where the world is going. All the IT guys will say amen, amen. They know that. You know that by the year 2025, we will have super computers in our pockets. We'll be walking around with super computers in our pockets. You'll be looking at your S7 that you're so proud of. You'll be looking at it and you'll be thinking, this thing is archaic. What were we thinking? Amen? The world is going mobile. Wi-Fi is becoming a human right. Is my human right? Where's the Wi-Fi? <laughs> That's why when people come from overseas where it's more advanced, what happens? They'll just come to us. They assume it's a free for all for everyone. And then you have to say, hey, my data, my data. <laughs> because where they come from, it's advanced there. It's for everyone. Free Wi-Fi. That's what's happening right now. Elon, our own Elon Musk, right? Speaking to Google, speaking to all these guys. About what? They want to have the whole world be a blanket of Wi-Fi. Free Wi-Fi. And guess what? Even with fancy computers, everyone is going to be able to play. The Chinese are coming out with smartphones that only cost 500 rand. Not 500 rand per month until you die. 500 rand <laughs> once off. Amen? So everyone will be able to play. In terms of education... How many of you are familiar with MOOCs? MOOCs. Okay. Massive open online courses from the top universities in the world. Stanford, Harvard. They're offering some of their courses free to multiple numbers of people online. Now, those of you in the training business, like myself, that has got implications, hasn't it? That's where the world is going. I want to encourage you to dream into the future. Are you hearing me today? And you might say, but Paul, I'm not a geek. I'm not a nerd. Paul, I'm not clued up on technology stuff. How many of you know that it's about collaboration? God has called us to be interdependent. Whatever your dream is, God will give you the man with the picture. Remember, we've spoken about that before. He will give you people. He'll place them around you strategically to help you get there. Amen? Finally, number eight, step number eight. Make your vision clear and vivid. Whatever vision God has given you, make it clear and vivid. Habakkuk or Habakkuk, chapter two, verse two. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. What does it mean? Make your vision plain. Make your dream plain. Make it clear. If you want to rise as a leader, have you noticed that the person who's the most clear is the one with the influence? Even if they're clearly wrong. If you've got a room full of people, the person with clarity is the one who becomes the go-to person. Have you noticed that? People are longing for clarity. They just want clarity. If it's misty in your head, it'll be foggy in the minds of the people listening to you. God has called us to be clear. How clear is your vision right now? It says, write it down and make it plain. How clear is your vision right now? Are you saying, yes, I want a husband? In a couple of weeks, we've got three weddings in the church, eh? In the space of one week, there'll be three weddings. Amen. Amen. Okay. This is the place to be if you want to get married. 
Mbai is saying, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Make it plain. It's one thing to say, I want a husband. It's another thing to say the type of husband you want. It's one thing to say, I want a happy family. What does that look like? If I had a video camera, what does that look like? A happy family. I want to encourage you to develop a mission statement, and I want to just do this in a moment to show you an example of a mission statement for your family. I want to encourage you to develop a mission statement for your business, but also for your family. Are you ready for that? Here are some powerful principles that you can use. I just wrote out 10 keys that you can use in developing a family mission statement. You see, when your vision is clear, when your vision is vivid, it's more likely to take place. Have you noticed how athletes operate? They visualize themselves doing the particular thing beforehand. They get themselves to that emotional state that they want to be in when they're going to win. Have a vision. Determine your emotional state. Extremely powerful. So, the key, first key, what's your family's cause? What's your family's raison d'etre? In the French, reason for existence. In the same way that I have a, an individual mission, some of it you can see actually in terms of some of the things that we've actually written out. I took my individual mission and placed it there and jointly we've come up with that. But we also have family mission. What is your family's cause? What is your family called to? You know that a basic need that every human being has in a family setting is the need to contribute. To contribute to each other and to contribute to society. What's your family's mission? Teams fail because they don't have missions. Often when I'll deal with groups and I say to them, hey guys, what's the key thing that makes your team strong? And what do they say? We've got a cause. I say to them, think of teams that you've been a part of in the past. Why were they so great? They say there was a common vision, a common goal. How many of you know that a family unit is a team? Unfortunately, with many families, they just function as groups. You just got these isolated beings who just stay under one roof, but they don't function as a team. What's your family's cause? I'm going to be going through a process like this, a deeper process with my family where we'll be talking about these things. Don't try and do it in just one sitting. You might decide, you know what? We want to sit down and we want to talk about our cause. Are you hearing me? These are the things that keep a family together. Often people say, a family that prays together stays together. I'm telling you right now, a family that is on a mission stays together. Because you can irritate each other. But when you need to go in the same direction, it keeps you together. Amen? Number two, what's the family's vision? A vision is a picture of a preferred future. What are you seeing yourself doing together? What will the papers in five years' time be saying about you and your household? What will they be saying? Oh, mom and dad are like this. Oh, the kiddies are like that. Oh, Daddy Sean is like this. Mommy Sunera is like that. Now Sean Anderson feels left out. Okay, Daddy Sean is like this. Mommy Kathy is like that. <laughs> Number three, what are the non-negotiable values in our family? That's very powerful, isn't it? Maybe it's mutual respect. We respect each other in this family. Well, what does that look like? What are the behaviors associated with mutual respect? Can you see? You have to break it down. If you say to me, we're a respectful family, Pastor. I'll say, okay, if I had a video, CCTV, there, camera, what does respect look like? For some people, it looks like pitching up on time, respecting time. For other people, it's never raising your voice. So when you come up with this, it's important to literally unpack what it looks like at a behavioral level. Amen? This is how you make your mission clear. This is how you make it vivid. It must paint a picture. And some of you are thinking, but Paul, I haven't got a family yet. See, that's our problem. People have this 20-year plan for this wonderful business idea. And they say, I'll only develop a family mission statement when my family starts. No. No. Even if you're a single individual, single as in not one, but single as in not married yet, 
What's your mission statement? What type of family do you want? Because when you've determined that and it's very clear, it will also paint a picture of the type of husband you'll have or wife. Don't settle for second best. Amen? Non-negotiable values. Number four, the climate. What's the climate of our home? What's the sound of our home? Where you sit down and you begin a process, we call it visioneering, where you're saying, we can just hear laughter. Our household is full of laughter. Sometimes my wife comes to me when I'm packing out laughing because my kids are making me laugh. She says, I love it when you're laughing with the kids, when you're packing out laughing. You know, there's laughing as in, ah, where you just want to encourage your kids. They've cracked a joke, but it's not that funny, and you're like, hey. right? Then there's laughing when it's, when it's coming from here, from your belly. Okay? There'll be sounds of laughter in our household. There'll be lots of grace, lots of forgiveness. That's the climate you want in your home. When you're talking about the climate of your home, you can even talk about some of your attributes. We're generous. There's an atmosphere of generosity. The language is upbuilding. You're bringing that forth. What do we talk about? What do we do? What type of meals do we have? That's the climate of your home. There's an atmosphere of flexibility. It's not a rigid environment. There's an atmosphere where we suspend judgment. We're not quick to criticize. What does it look like? If you could play a video of your family life, what's the ideal family life that you want? That's dreaming for the households that you want. Number five, rituals. What are the rituals in your household? We celebrate birthdays. And a birthday celebration doesn't have to be expensive. Why is it important to celebrate birthdays? It's the only day people are celebrated just for existing, hey? Just for being around. Hey, Haron, you're still here. Cool, we celebrate you, Dad. <laughs> Whether we've liked what you did last week or whatever, we just have to acknowledge it. Right? Some of the rituals. What are some of the other rituals? We have devotions. So one of our rituals is I go, I'll pray with the kids, right? And then they'll say, don't forget, Dad, can you call Mom up to tuck us in, please? I'll pray for them just before they've gone to bed, and I kind of think they're tucked in, job done. Dad, don't forget to call Mom. <laughs> but it's become a ritual. My love, kids are ready for you. <laughs> it's a ritual. And then she goes in and then she tucks them in. And if she's away or she's doing something at church, when I try to tuck them in, I say, no, Dad, this is how Mom does it. See, she puts this pillow here. It's this. But that gives children a sense of security. And when the routine breaks and when the ritual breaks, they start feeling insecure. How many of you know that you can intentionally create certain rituals? What are the rituals you want to have in your family? How many of you know that we become successful not based on our wishes, but based on our rituals and habits and routine? See, very often we judge ourselves based on the peaks in our life instead of our lifestyle. Our lifestyle is formed through the rituals that we have. Amen? The things we do on a regular basis. What rituals do you want to have? Maybe it's saying grace when you're about to eat. Not a rushed grace, not an unthought through grace, but you're actually giving thanks. Amen? Number six, celebrations. As you craft your family mission statement, you need to state, this is what we celebrate. We celebrate victories, we celebrate hard work, we celebrate breakthrough in our lives. Some people like to keep things secrets, and then they have a personal breakthrough, then they like to show their kids and their family that, look, they're the hero. Instead of actually saying, kids, family, we believe in God for this, and then God gets the glory when you have the breakthrough. Amen? Number seven, what are your family habits? What are your family habits? Maybe it's we exercise. Maybe it's we cheer in sport. Sometimes we go and we are, we're watching one of the kids doing their sport and the other one is busy playing with his friends and so on. Then we say, are you going to watch Sammy do his high jump or do his long jump? Come on, he'll watch you when you're doing your soccer or your other thing. Are you going to cheer him on? Come, let's go down and let's cheer him on. That's what we do in this family. 
Those are the habits that you might want to have. Maybe for some of you it's habits around chores. That when you're eating supper together, those of you who eat, and I encourage you to do so, to eat supper together, where people don't just leave while other people are still eating because they want to quickly watch a movie or something. No. But they excuse themselves. Thank you for the meal. Excuse me. Can you excuse me from the table, please? And they only leave when they're excused. Amen? And they wait for the slower eaters. <laughs> I'm one of the slowest eaters I know. <laughs> and it's not because I talk a lot. Even when I'm fairly quiet, you know, I chew. It's healthier. But it's interesting. It's important that we have family habits. Are you hearing me? What are your habits? What are the habits you want to instill in your family? Maybe it's around cleanliness, that we brush teeth, not just during school days. <laughs> Number eight, what will your calendar look like? Your calendar and your routine. We're a church-going family. That's what we do on Sundays, right? Maybe that's on your calendar. This is a calendar item. It's a standing agenda. Right? This is what we do. This is how our week looks. And everything else revolves around that. Maybe it's to do with holidays. Maybe you have one annual holiday or two annual holidays as a family. This is part of your mission. Are you hearing me? Number nine, what are your no-nos? In other words, things that we don't do in this family. There's no physical violence unless we are wrestling with dad or playing with each other. But even then, there are rules around that. Okay? Boys don't speak to girls in a certain way. Boys don't speak off girls in a certain way. Boys don't use certain terms for girls, even if they've heard other people doing so. In this family, we don't do that. We don't use foul language. Right? What are the no-nos? Let me tell you something. Your children will do what they see you do, not what they hear you say. Yeah? I was telling my kids the other day, we were in the car, and I said, don't you guys like catch up with each other and say, Jaden, how was your day? Samuel, how was your day? Don't you like do that? They said, no, we just start talking about how the day was. But they asked me an interesting question. They said, Dad, when you were growing up, did you do that? <laughs> It was so long ago, I don't really remember. <laughs> the thing is, they're interested in what you do and what you did. They're not interested in what you have to preach to them. Culture is not created just by what we teach. Culture is created by what we model. So what are the no-nos in your family? What are the things that are considered great sins in your family? And then number 10... What are the unique talents and potential that your family has? That you know what, as a family, we are good at this. You know what, as a family, we're so good at this, we can actually bless the nation with the following things. There's some things that are so normal for you and your family because you're used to it. But other families come to you and they say, wow, you guys are amazing at this. What is it that you have? The tribes of Israel had strengths. If you looked at the tribe of Benjamin, they had specific strengths. If you look at the Levites, they had specific strengths. When God calls a family, he endows the family with certain gifts and unique talents. And very often you see that, oh, this is something. It's passed on from mom and now the kids also have it. What is it in your family? Or what do you want it to be? Amen? I'm going to give you an example of a family mission statement. I'm going to go through it quickly. I think it's so powerful. We are compassionate and kind. We are committed to family. We love, create, and protect family time, both one-on-one -on -one and everyone together. We will be caring in our relationships with our family and friends. We want to be role models for our children. We will encourage creative expression in each other. Can you see there's already a gift there and they're encouraging it. We will lovingly support each other as we strive to reach our individual potentials. We will grow old and wise together. Right? We will show consistent, appropriate, loving affection. That's the climate of the family. We're a hugging family. Even if sometimes you have to force certain people to hug. My wife sometimes forces the kids, forces hugs on them. They're like, whoa, 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 and she wrestles them down. Okay? 
We will seek out opportunities that develop and grow us. We will build each other's self-esteem through attitudes, values, and behavior that reinforces security, significance, self-respect. You can see my languaging there. Self-acceptance, self-confidence, and self-worth. Our home will be filled with love and laughter. We will use humor to build up, not to tear down. The other day, my son Jaden said, concerning one of his brothers, you see, what he's saying is not upbuilding, it's downbuilding, Dad, it's downbuilding. <laughs> like, okay, let's submit that into the 2016 dictionary, downbuilding. <laughs> okay? Our home will be a safe space to inspire and renew us, enabling us to contribute our best to the world. Is your home a safe space? Do you feel safe at home? Or do you delay coming back from work because you're avoiding home? Ladies, just watch out for that. Hey, some husbands do that. Some guys do that. They actually, they, they could have come home earlier, but home is no longer a safe space. Or some of them come back late to avoid having to do certain chores. It happens. They're too tired to play with the kids and stuff, so they come late on purpose. Okay, so don't fall for that. Sorry, guys, I just I had to say that. Okay. Our home will be a haven for our family and friends to gather and share life's ups and downs. Is your home a place of ministry? I know CCC is happy on that one. Tick box, got that, yeah. Is your home a place of ministry for people? Our home will be a nurturing place for children and animals. My dad used to say to that when we were growing up, guys must learn to look after our pets here. Don't make sure they're always fed. Make sure, you know, just be responsible with them. Our home will be a safe and comfortable place for respectful self-expression. Okay, so at, at our house we have dancing competitions and the kids love that. And they all think they're brilliant. But it'll be a safe and comfortable place for respectful self-expression. There's some forms of self-expression we've had to sort of, you know, guys... Don't do that, especially with their ladies around. Okay. We enjoy helping <laughs> we, you know, with boys. We enjoy helping others in our daily lives. We strive to work with passion and discipline. We nurture, support, and celebrate each other's ambitions, dreams, and missions. We are always honest and do the right thing, even when no one is looking. We will live our lives in a manner that is free from harm to other living beings. We want to bring the peace within our home to our world community. Isn't that a powerful family mission? What's yours going to be? I encourage you to come up with that. And then finally, dreaming for your business. Dreaming with God for your business. I want to encourage you, go and look at Proverbs chapter 31. In my book, Business God's Way and also in Kingdom Business. I cover it in a particular chapter. Some of you have read where I talk about the Proverbs 31 woman, but not as a woman per se, but as an entrepreneur. And there are 13 qualities I list there, right, about a biblical entrepreneur. One of them, for example, is that home is important for her. The work she is doing in terms of business doesn't mean she neglects her home. Do you notice that? Okay, she's generous to her staff talks about what she does with her maidens, okay? She's generous with her staff. She's a good planner. It says that when winter comes, she's not phased by it, okay? Those are principles of biblical entrepreneurship that you see there. And it's amazing because she's still admired by her family. It says that she's praised at the city gates and honored by her husband. My question to you is the dream you have for your business, is it taking you away from being a good father, good mother, good family person potentially for those who are single? Ask yourself that question. So how can we dream with God for our business? By answering the following questions and you'll get the notes. We'll post them up on the website. But just close your eyes and just begin to dream with God right now. What problems need a solution? Just think about that. What problems in our nation right now need a solution? There's a business idea there. There's a business idea there. If I start a business with toothpaste, what problem am I addressing? People always say, yeah, tooth decay. Thank you so much, Jimmy. A lot of times people say, bad breath. Okay. Plaque. What frustrates people in this city? 
If you look at the frustrations that people have in this city, I can tell you right now there's a business idea there. What is abundant in some parts of the country but not in others? Can you bring it here? I bought from a guy from Venda, uh, one of my clients, I bought some lovely avocado pears. How many of you have tasted avocado avos from Venda? Raise your hand up. Right? And sweet potatoes from Venda. Uh, raise your hand if you've tasted. Okay? Now people who are from there who've got access to farming there and so on, that's an example. What's in abundance in other areas that people here like will bring it over. Okay? What, is about, what products can I combine for ease of use? Remember back in the day? Back in the day when you went on holiday, you'd have your video camera, you'd have your telephone, those big brick cell phones, okay? You would have your still camera, right? You would have all sorts of things, your calculator. But what, did, what happened here? Combined. How many of you know there are a lot of business opportunities when you combine things? Just be open to receive from heaven. I've done this before and people come out with all sorts of ideas, hey? Straight afterwards, like God literally pitches up and gives them business ideas. Dreaming with God. What is rare in this country but many people need it? Some of you are from other countries. Countries that have abundance when it comes to natural resources. What can I package better? Looks ugly so people don't buy it. What can I package better? What can I remove packaging from to make it cheaper? Some things are overly packaged. It will be way cheaper if they weren't packaged that way. Where can I cut out the middleman? What is innovating? Or who is innovating but can't sell? There are a lot of people, they're very good at inventing things but they don't know how to sell. Maybe you're good at selling. Who is selling but can't innovate? Who has money but no ideas? And you're the ideas person. I've met someone like that before. He had sold something in his business. He says, Paul, I've never had so much cash, but I'm looking for a business opportunity. If you're an ideas person, you link up with that person. Who has skills but no money or ideas? What message do people need to hear? Those of you who are speakers, who are communicators, and you do it professionally, what message do people need to hear? I'm always coming up with new topics for my corporates. What message do people need to hear? What products have not yet been marketed effectively? What are we importing that we can make locally and perhaps even sell cheaper? I want to encourage you, whatever dreams you have, Translate them into goals with an action plan and you'll be amazed what God will do in your life. How many of you are ready to dream with God? Let's pray.